those who's been posting from Osu or Teshin or from other parts of Accra, you might be one of the, well, 30%, according to official statistics, who do not have access to safe, clean pipe bomb water every day. If you are in the rural areas, well, more than half. With me in the studio is Franklin Kujo. He's the founding president of the Imani Think Tank, Center for Education and Policy Research. And my question to him is really quite simple this morning. What have we learned when it comes to our water resources and our water delivery systems? How well are we applying that knowledge? And does it actually translate into policy and pragmatic programs and projects on the ground. Good morning and welcome to Sunrise Franklin. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. So all the things that I said about water in my introduction, that it's possibly going to be one of the reasons for security or insecurity in the near future. People are going to go to war, not over land or diamonds or religious beliefs or gold or even oil energy, but because of water resources mm -hmm. and the fact that millions and millions of Ghanaians do not have access to clean, safe drinking water because these statistics they actually translate into people and we try to, mm. or we tend to dehumanize the issue when we look at it statistically. Mm. Well, first of all, I like your intro that the next war will possibly be over water, water conflict, um, so after, after oil. And by the way, you know, water rights, basically land rights begets water rights as well, so clearly there's that nexus. Um, but you pose a very important question as to whether we are thinking in humanistic terms uh, of, of the what I call the clear present danger. You know, uh, there, uh, there's been a lot of statistics. And again, uh, what our aid says that 80% of all our diseases are actually related to uh, poor water and poor sanitation, which I tend to believe really. And um, you are also very right on the statistics you gave us to the access levels. The question you ask yourself is, why should we, in the midst of plenty, be thirsty? Because every region in this country has a quarter body close to it, if you study it carefully. But we've done a bit of some uh, field research in the uh, eastern region, specifically the Kwehu North uh, District Assembly and the Birim North District Assembly. And you'd be amazed that the Kogun North District Assembly is where you, you typically have what's called the Afram Place. And all over there's water. There's water everywhere. There's water it's everywhere. Waterlogged. There are two, well, there was a district water sanitation, 40 water systems. As we speak, only 20 have been. That's about 8%. No, that's about 8%. 8%. Now, well, then it's really worrying. So the picture I'm trying to paint is that beyond the urban water delivery system, which is in complete shambles, there's also the fact that in the rural areas, there are, there are present problems as well. And um, in the midst of plenty, as we say, um, we, get, we tend to get thirsty when we shoot it, really. So the question I'm supposing you are going to ask again is, how do we fix these things? And clearly, as you intimated in your intro, they all both at the doorstep of policy. Clearly, for 50 years, we've been doing this whole managerial system, I said managing the urban water supply, and indeed the community water and sanitation uh, agenda. Unfortunately, we haven't been that successful. So you know that most of the water systems here in the urban areas haven't delivered that much. So if you live in the peri-urban areas of Accra, Adenta, and a bit beyond, you tend to buy water three, four, five times that which the people living in the CDB would buy, the central business district would buy. And I, but then there's a little problem when it comes to this whole agenda of costing. Because, you know, clearly we do have, everybody knows that we have an infrastructure deficit when it comes to especially water. And to suggest that the problem has been one of management is to, uh, is, is to underestimate the potential in the, I mean, the water delivery uh, system. I'm saying this because over the last 10 or 12 years, we focused solely on managing water, as in managing the urban delivery uh, system. When in actual fact, what we should be doing is to be expanding access. I mean, um, it's, it's amazing. Expanding access. As expanding access. So invest more 
into the systems. The systems we have are decrepit. I mean, they are old, they are tired, just as we have with the electricity transmission. Some of the, uh, some of the transmission lines are all really uh, in, in, in arthritic uh, 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 positions. And Is so it a profitable investment, though? Is it an area that you think well, makes good business sense to put money into? Of course. You know what? You know, just look at it from this angle. The people who are living in the peri-urban outliers of the city struggle to buy water. You know, if you look at the emergence of sachet water, it's as a result of satisfying one well inadequate water and then good drinking water, which is not there. And then of but course people the are buying. And then they are the tracks. Sometimes you don't even know the source, but you buy because you need it. So this whole debate about balancing the issue of human rights as against commodification of water is a bit amazing because you see, someone has got to invest money into treating the water. If it says a human right, it got to travel over land. Someone has to treat the water, get the systems, and if you are asked to pay a little bit, I'm not too sure it is affecting your human right. In actual fact, if you do not have good drinking water, it's against your human right. So you think that, you know, regardless of what we might, you know, hope uh, mm. that our policy uh, says when it's mm. implemented on the ground or how mm. it feels, we do have private water delivery mechanisms that are in daily practice it's in the forms of sachet water which sure. are very popular sure. bottled water sure. or even trucked water for sure. those who can afford it or who have sure. access to it sure. it's there you know one of the mistakes we make in economics and indeed some of our social commentators make is to look at privatization in this you know as if it's some bigger magadon happening or as this chronic capitalist big style privatization no on a small scale, these things are happening. And if you've seen the benefits of privatization, even in the telecoms industry, you can say you, they are not the same. But it's vital to communicate. Now, price levels are low because there's competition. We need that same type of competition in the water delivery. What we don't need is to have management contracts. That actually is an insult to our intelligence, where we do privatization to get people to come and manage revenue collection. That's so, not the problem. So, so what's the nature of a public-private partnership when it comes well, to a resource such as water good. that you think would work? Is there a model that exists well, in similar conditions to ours that you know has met or even exceeded expectations? It has exceeded expectations in most, I'll call, advanced countries. But there's also some literature to the extent that within Africa, the reasons why water privatization schemes have been worked is essentially because of the overbearing nature of government. And I have to explain here, because what it exactly happens is that when governments have seen the need to invite private participation, so private capital, what happens is that, first of all, they don't, well, government also is big, by the way, so it owes, you know, they don't pay their water bills. And at a point when the private operator sees that that is sagging because it's affecting the investment, then at that juncture, the government says, well, look, we don't even need you anyway. It's, if you study the privatization systems across Africa, it has always been the case that the nemesis has been government overbearance and the fact that government owes and doesn't want to pay. It's the same thing with the electricity agenda. Government owes... $500 million, the equivalence of 400 megawatts of power. That is why we are in a mess. So clearly, there's an approach, but that approach is predicated on respect for both parties. First of all, you've got to give the topographical data of the country to any private participant. You've got to sit down and talk about how much you actually need. We do know that community water and sanitation needs about $250 million. I know for a fact that there's a Canadian facility to get about 150 million, but the community water people are fit to drag in because for some reason, I don't know, there's all this um, uh, vaunt regard for the, the centre must do everything, and, and that is worrying. So that type of partnership and the model that works is predicated on respect. Respect in terms of financial transparency, respect in terms of paying up your bills as government, and respect in terms of allowing people to also decide. Because you and I would be very, very much happy if we were getting clean water running every day and we're paying a little extra than the situation is right now. 
and there's one interesting statistic I like to really share, which which makes a mockery of the issue about access to water, especially urban water uh, delivery. You know, six years ago, there was a, some statistics by the WHO, corroborated by government officials, that 79% of urban dwellers in Ghana had access to Have access. water. Over 70%, yes. But that's not true. If by access, you mean a standing pipe, that's true. But if by access you mean standing pipes with running water, the reality is different. You're saying that when we are talking about access, we measure the pipelines. We just measure the pipelines. It's not what is in them. Because <laughs> as you know, clearly speaking, 50% of our water, as we know, is unaccounted for. So it goes just it goes to waste. That's, that's one. But in actual fact, you've heard the stories of people say we have to wake up. Sometimes the water comes once in two weeks. Well, that is access. But that access is not constant. And so those are just running pipes. But this has persisted with us over government. I mean, we've talked about policies and exactly. transformations and projects and programs. Right. I remember this going back to my school days. I was, sure. a, I was a school boy. The school would close down and say, everybody go home. There's no water. Exactly. Sometimes, you know, you have to wake up in the night to fetch water. Sure. This has been with us for generations. Exactly. I experienced same. Six from Pope John's. I was amazed those times when ladies from the other school, um, Ganas, uh, when we boys were complaining that look we've not had water they said well you have been complaining we've not seen water for days you know what that means but clearly speaking the problem again is like writing an examination and repeating questions and answers the answer lies in one proper investment schemes see capital is a cowardly bed and you are aware of that if you don't give us proper uh, you know if you don't do what you call the enabling environment as always then clearly nobody would come in. But also, if you have this vaunted love for strategic assets, just like Ghana had him having just one airline saying it's a strategic asset, when the airline actually birth, 60 people flew on it for free. If it is the case that you want to hold on to water systems as a strategic asset because it's a security matter, then you never ever get water to people because one, you don't have the wherewithal in terms of your abilities to think outside of the, <laughs> your remit to know how exactly how you should get water to people. And by going outside of your remit, it means you seek help. But that help is not money you get on Hollywood. You get it on Wall Street. And if you're going to get money from Wall Street, it's not charity. You've got to understand that you've got to cost it and and then find a way of getting people to understand that these are life important issues and you need to also sacrifice a bit. I believe people in our study, in our field work in the various regions, you'll be amazed when we ask uh, rural folks, would you want to contribute when the water systems, actually we would you want to contribute this, initially say, oh, um, because of our relative economic uh, you know, uh, circumstances, uh, we don't think we have. Then you ask a follow-up question. What if the water system goes bad? So, oh, when it, whenever it happens, we always contribute money to fix it. But talking about uh, thinking outside the box in terms of self-reliance, do you think that it's a really good and solid idea for us to go and incur international debt in order mm. to be able to provide ourselves with safe drinking water and water for sanitation and hygiene and industrial purposes. We have the resources. The people of Wall Street have pieces of paper that say that, you know, they are worth that much. By themselves, the paper is worthless. Mm -hmm. Our resources, though, are worth a lot by themselves. Well, you know, one of the things I've also studied and understood about privatization is not that it ought, ought, obviously ought to be uh, international, but in this case, in our critical condition right now, the sort of money you need, the billion, one billion dollars that you need, I'm not too sure we can mobilize enough here. That said, I hear you and I totally agree with you that we should start deconcentration of power. Decentralizing goes with giving authority to district uh, level managers, as well as the ability to raise money so that all these water systems that are dotted over the country, they can manage them. Every region can have its own water system. I don't know how difficult it is. If the eastern region has the Birim, we have an OT, every region here has a water system, a water body. Give them back the power 
and they would definitely be able to. Uh, I mean, if we can do it with wa sachet water, we can do it with water oh, tankers. That's, that's Why can't we do this uh, on a slightly larger scale? You and I know, as uh, fans of libertarianism, somehow that you know small, small innovative ideas. You know, like they say, um, when when you when wh well when you have uh, austerity, that's when you begin to think. It was exactly the need for good drinking water that led ordinary people, someone, to think, can I transport water, sell water in a sachet, in hygienic condition? If people can think at that level, that's why we, you and I, <laughs> I know we, we like that. We like, you know, a small government, you want things to emerge from bottom up. If people at the bottom can think of creative ways of solving their situation, which can birth to this national skill of providing water across the country, obviously, why shouldn't our governments be able to encourage more of such things? And we've seen it work. What would you say to Alassan Adam, who speaks for the campaign against water privatization mm. and who was uh, quoted by the BBC as having said that we are seeing the water system collapsing at a faster rate mm. than it was under public management? It's something that Felix I, one of our viewers, is drawing our attention to. Well, that fact is in fact not a fact because my good friend was one of the people who was against the protestation of water at the time and I agreed with him because the management contract was the wrong thing to do. But he is also part of the problem because they are the people, unfortunately, who confuse the public as to what really privatization means. If, you are, if privatization is all you see, there's some Westerner coming to take over your staff, then fine. But I also support him in another str in another stretch when he talks about the transparency of some of these uh, 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 engagements. It's the chronic capitalistic arrangement that makes it look as if privatization is really bad. If we were going to privatize and we didn't know the tendering process, we didn't know who was getting what, the risk uh, and all of that, and to finally get a management contract, that is bad. But I also disagree finally with him when he says that the public systems are fast, oh, he says they are fast depreciating and are private than they were under public. Yes. But that's wrong because as we speak right now, most of the problems we've had right now are actually birthed <laughs> under a public management system. I In mean, fact, how many... The, the private systems that we mentioned, the, the, the bottled water, the sachet water, yes. the tracked water, now that has bloomed in yeah. private hands. When it's yeah. fully private, we, we don't even complain. We buy the pure water. Exactly. We don't complain. When we need water, we, we even try to get friends to tell you of, uh, of a safe or reliable tanker operator. Can you imagine? So that's why I'm saying that we have a problem with the definition of privatization itself. But I also agree that because our government, successive governments have not been that thorough when it comes to tendering process, we tend to look at these things from a very, n n I mean, uh, capitalistic... You know, but is there a lesson that we can learn from uh, some of our larger resource exploitation systems like oil and gold on the one hand, and the smaller ones like uh, water, sachet water, tracked water, which is purely indigenous, mm -hmm. and find a golden middle for pipe-borne water? Perhaps there's a middle way, but unfortunately, that middle way sometimes doesn't come with the requisite lessons. I also say, learn from those things that have worked. The other uh, issue, the other examples to give, mining and all of that, well, I think it's a failure of regulation. I've always never believed the issue that we should be blaming multinationals for not getting the requisite revenues. You don't blame them. You set up a proper regulatory mechanism rather than thinking about yourself, and that helps you. So if in the telcos, if all you want is to get some money for some uh, fund somewhere and use it for some other purposes, rather than think about how you can actually develop the, the sector to ensure your people benefit, then that's another agenda. So clearly, I understand the middle way. Sometimes the middle way is dangerous, but it appears at this juncture, let's learn from those things that are thriving. They are all around us. As you say, uh, my friend, uh, a good friend of mine recently said, well, Franklin, we don't like you because you like this privatization thing. I said, you know what? Why don't you go and fetch the Odor River, Odor water, fresh and nice, 
and drink because that is, is natural <laughs> and it's fresh. And once again, if the privatization has a considerable component of mm. indigenous ownership and participation mm. to it, I'm mm. sure people would have a lot less of a problem. It's also it. the way you arrange the public-private partnership thing. In fact, I love this PPP thing, but I'm beginning to think a bit otherwise, that if you don't put together the system and say, if it is the issue of local content, look at how we badly manage that. Local content, okay, let's create a pool of Ghanaian entrepreneurs who will be willing to put in X amount with government intervention just to regulate and then have that a partnership going. But you and I know why these things won't happen. Because the person is looking over the shoulder, well, what are you getting? How much can you get? I think we need to... It's a serious attitude now. Can you see hope? Need. Can you see light at the end of the tunnel? No. Well, Sorry, water at the end of the pipe. Well, definitely. You know, Imani means hope in one verse. Can you see water? Area. I mean, do you I sometimes listen to your pipe and hear the water is coming or it's coming? Well, first of all, I don't have No one starts coughing pipe. like... I don't have running pipe. I have my own experiences of running water pipes, but I don't have... But um yes when it starts doing that as you describe do you, do you see it coming in general do you think there's hope looking at I see what we have now what we are doing what uh, what uh, what we are talking about do you think that there is hope in the near future in the foreseeable future for us to actually be able to deliver safe water at an affordable price to everyone in ghana there is hope but the hope is predicated upon us sitting on a time bomb when people begin to fall more sick when there's cholera, dysentery, diarrhea, typhoid, when all these beef, that is the only time we'll act. That is the only hope I have. Well, I've always said I'm waiting for the day when a politician gets up on a public uh, platform at the podium and announces we have found water in commercial quantities in Ghana and uh, <laughs> we are going to make it available to everyone. I've been speaking to Franklin Kujo, he's the founding president of Imani, a globally recognized think tank that focuses on education and policy analysis. The topic has been water and it looks like, well, whilst there is hope, that hope has to be predicated on sound judgment, having learnt the lessons from the past and applying them in a way that will be to everyone's benefit and profit and prosperity.